Welcome, Brother Robert, tonight, Apostle Robert. Let him share his heart tonight. Those by stream, we welcome you tonight as well. Good evening. All right, I love to teach on this principle. I, I, I uh, travel around quite a bit, and this is part of what I teach. I teach it in schools and in different settings because the body of Christ, some of us are awakening to the fact that um, maybe there's there's some tweaking, i use that word, tweaking of our intercessory ministry, prayer ministry that we have before the Lord because <clears throat> my deal is this. I'm not, I'm not interested in just putting out more effort and energy to somehow or another pacify my conscience that I did something. I want results. And, um, and we do know that there is something very powerful about perseverance, just persevering in prayer, because Jesus shared that many times in his teachings, that part of the realm of prayer requires perseverance, where we just keep pressing and pushing. But at the same time, we have to balance that out with this, that we're not heard for our much speaking. Remember when Jesus said that to the Pharisees and his disciples when he was teaching? He said, you need to know that God knows the things you have need of even before you ask. So prayer is not informing God of our needs. Prayer is actually working with God to see that which we desire, need, and his kingdom purposes come into being because we're actually working with him to accomplish that. And I made some statements this morning that I want to go into more and more, but let me just start with this with this, this way. I'm going to start in for this group that may be very elementary because I know that uh, Apostle Tim has taught some things and Natasha and so forth, but I don't know where you are, so I'm just going to start where I normally start and help us understand some things. <clears throat> I mentioned this morning that prayer, we have to discern where the conflict is when we enter into the realm of prayer. I mean, we know there's a conflict because in Daniel, I think it's chapter 10, when Daniel began to pray, he prayed for 21 days, and an angel finally got through with the angel, or excuse me, with the answer. But once the angel got through with the answer, he said, you were heard from the first day that you started praying. So the issue wasn't being heard. The issue was that there were demonic forces in the spirit realm that were resisting the answers from coming through. Okay? So... The issue was that over his 21 days of praying, what happened was that Michael the archangel was sent and all sorts of things happened in this unseen realm, and finally the answer came through. But that, what that says to us is that when we pray, we're entering a conflict. We're, you're, you're not just asking God for something. When we began to pray, we're, we're, we're engaging heaven, but we're also being engaged by the demonic, and there is a resistance in the demonic realm of what God wants to happen and what we want to happen from occurring. So we have to realize, number one, that there is a conflict when we pray. Okay, so, so the, the, the reason sometimes we don't get answers and certainly don't get them quickly is not because God's not releasing them. <clears throat> It's because of the conflict we're in. Okay, so I'm, I just wanted to establish that for a few moments. We're in a conflict when we pray. Okay, the second thing I want to establish or the question I want to ask is where is this conflict? Now, I was raised to believe that the conflict was on some kind of spiritual battlefield. I mean, we're taught to be warriors. And, and by the way, that's right. That's, that's biblical. But I want you to understand that from my persuasion, here's what I want you to get is that the conflict we're in when we pray initially is not a battlefield, it's a courtroom. Now, why is that important? And I'll prove to you that it is, but why is that important? Because the protocol of a courtroom is completely different from the protocol of a battlefield. You see, you don't behave yourself in a courtroom the same way you behave yourself in a battlefield. Because if you do, you'll be found in contempt of court, at the very least. So, so here's the deal. We have to know where the conflict is. Where, where are we at? And so here, here's what I want you to see. The re, how, how many of you have ever prayed for something, gone after something in the spirit realm, especially some of you intercessors, and instead of seeing breakthrough, you encountered what we call backlash? Where then all of a sudden you start getting attacked because you're going after something in the spirit realm, after something in God that you know is God's agenda and God's heart, but while you're going at it and trying to push it through, all of a sudden you start getting hit. 
Let me tell you in my persuasion why that happens. The reason that happens is because we haven't bothered to get legal things in place first. You see, if we get legal things in place first, then we have firm legal precedent set and we can mar- march onto the battlefield and win. But if we don't get legal things in place first and engage the enemy, we will suffer backlash because he has a right to come against us because we get, did not get legal things in place. Look with me in Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. Let me just show you this principle. It'll help us, I think, understand what I want to try to communicate here. Revelation 19 and verse 11, it says, Now I, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. Now we know that's Jesus. And in righteousness, notice this, in righteousness he judges and makes war. Notice the order. He does not make war before he judges. Judges, judge. Judgment or judge speaks of judicial activity. That's what happens in a court. It's decisions that are being made from a judicial system, from a courtroom setting. The Bible says that before Jesus marches forth and makes war, the first thing he does is judge or get judicial things in place. So I have to know how to go into the courtroom of heaven and get judicial things in place before I march onto the battlefield. Because if I march onto the battlefield without judgments in place from the throne of God, I risk everything from not being effective to suffering backlash. You see, I think it's foolish that there's somehow or another there's something we're missing that we just somehow or another expect backlash to occur because I've engaged the enemy while I'm trying to propel the kingdom of God forward. I'm thinking there's something missing here. There's something that's not that we don't understand. I believe that this is a piece of it. He judges and then he makes war. Now, Luke 18, look at me in Luke 18. Luke 18 is a parable that Jesus spoke about prayer. Luke 18, in verses 1 through 8, and I just want you to turn there. But it says that Jesus spoke this parable that men ought always to pray and not to lose heart, not to turn coward. So the purpose of this prayer, Jesus said, or the Bible says, was for Jesus to encourage them. Now, you need to understand, we must understand that when Jesus is going to encourage them, he's not taking a cheerleading prayer posture see how is he going to encourage them by releasing another secret to them concerning prayer so they can be effective in prayer see we think well he's going to encourage them to pray he's going to cheerlead them he's going to pump them up he's not going to do any such thing he's going to unveil a secret that has been hidden that's going to make them more effective in prayer so that they're going to want to pray because now they're understanding something they didn't understand before So the scripture says he taught this parable for that purpose, to to encourage them to pray and not to lose heart and faith. What does he talk about? He talks about a certain widow who comes to an evil, wicked judge and says, get justice for me. Get justice for me. And he would not for a while, but but afterwards he said, this woman's going to wear me out, so I'm going to give her what she wants. And then the scripture says, how much more will God avenge his own elect? who cry out to him day and night, he said, yes, he will avenge them speedily. Okay, let me give you three issues here. Number one, in this parable, Jesus puts prayer in a judicial system. He says, when you pray, you're stepping into a judicial system because that's where judges reside and judges operate. So whenever he says this widow, he pick, makes a, a parable of a widow becoming, coming before an unrighteous judge. But then he says, how much more will God? He's saying that, look, if, if she got a verdict from an unrighteous judge, how much more can we get verdicts from the righteous God, the judge of all that we serve? So the first thing I want you to realize is Jesus puts prayer within a judicial system. That judicial system is heaven. Number two, at no time in this parable does this woman address her adversary. 
she never yells. She never screams. She never curses. She never binds. She never looses. She never does anything. She realizes my success is totally caught up in a verdict from the judge, not me doing something to the adversary. She realizes that if she can get a verdict from the judge, that will incapacitate the adversary and he will be dealt with. Are you noticing that in that parable? Why? Because she understands the conflict of prayer is not on a battlefield where she's got to do hand-to-hand warfare against an adversary. She realizes the real conflict is getting a judgment from a throne that will incapacitate the adversary so that, that, so that she wins the victory and gets the justice she's crying for. So that changes the game. That changes the way we think. Are you following me here? Okay, so now watch. I just want to be very clear. Here's the deal. Once you get judgments in place, once verdicts are rendered from the court, then we also as God's people and the ecclesia can begin to make decrees against adversaries and they will have to obey them because now there's legal precedence in place to cause that to happen. To try to do that without legal things in place is to fail. And I've had my share of failures. So I'm an expert at it. And I got tired of failing. So I thought, there's something here we need to learn. Are you, are you tracking with me so far? So two things. <clears throat> is that it's in a judicial system. And she never addresses the adversary. She only speaks to the judge. Because she realizes what she needs more than anything else is a legal rendering from this court to allow her victory over her adversary. Third thing. It says, and God will will not God avenge his own elect speedily. Here's what I've experienced. I have watched things I have prayed for for years. For years. I have watched them when I got off the battlefield and got into the courtroom happen almost immediately. Because suddenly it was no longer about spending more time in prayer. It wasn't about striving. It was about learning secrets. See, I've I've kind of figured something out in my course of my lifetime of following the Lord and trying to understand him. Sometimes we as the church say, well, if we would just pray more, if we would just do more, if we would just be more, then something different would happen. And we birth a spirit of striving sometimes in the church. Listen, I don't believe we need to strive. I believe we need to learn secrets. Because secrets employed can re- bring results that for, in, in, in situations that we have labored a long time in and saw nothing. Let me give you an illustration, just personal illustration. I have one of my sons with me, Mark. But I have a, a, my second son's name is Adam. And just, you know, be very transparent with you because you just need to understand the situation to appreciate the story I'm about to tell. Adam uh, was a youth pastor up in the northwest part of our country. He and his wife had moved up there. I had a friend. They ended up on staff, had done very, very well. Long and story short was that the, the girl that he was married to after two or three years just w- wanted to move back down to Texas, be with her mom, be with her old friends, and they had had a baby girl. Long story short was she ended up divorcing Adam and lives back in Texas. It was a very sad situation. Uh, Adam wasn't without fault, but nothing warranted the decisions that they were, that were made. And so Adam ended up in this situation at 20, you know, five, six years old in a divorce state, uh, in a divorce situation and unable or uh, his, you know, not being with his child that he loves dearly and all this kind of thing. It threw him into a tremendous state of depression. And I couldn't get him out. I mean, I tried to encourage him. I loved him. I shamed him. 
I did everything I knew to get him out, to try to break him. He was in this depression for two plus years. Nothing I could do could get him out. I prayed for him every day. I prayed, I worshiped, I cried, I yelled, I screamed, I bound, I loosed. I did everything I knew to do. Nothing happened. Nothing worked. Anybody have a situation like that? This is just one of my personal situations. So what happened was I go to prayer one morning like normal, and I began to become a little bit aware of some of what I'm teaching you. And as I went to prayer, I heard the Lord say, bring Adam to my courts. I heard him say that. I had not a clue really how to do it. But here's what I did. I said, Father, I just come and I just bring Adam before your court into your throne room of grace and mercy. And I want to present him to you. And I knew enough to know this, that there is an accuser according to Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11, that is accusing us before God day and night. I knew that. And and, And so I knew that he had accusations he was bringing against Adam. So I began to, to pray, and I began as, a, as his father and as an intercessor. Now, Adam's no way around. I began to repent for the uh, way Adam had just laid down under the situation and not believed God. I said, I just repent for his faithlessness. I repent for his unbelieving. I repent for him not embracing your grace. I repented for everything I could think of that the accuser could be using against Adam in this situation and resisting what God wanted for him from occurring. So I just began to repent because that's what we do. I'll get into that more in here in just a moment. That's what we do in the courts of heaven. We repent because we're seeking to give God the legal right as judge to grant his father's passion. I knew it was his father's passion for Adam not to be in this situation, but I knew there was something holding him here. So I just began to repent for everything the accuser was using. And all of a sudden in the spirit, I just felt a release. I just felt this release in prayer. And then I heard the Lord say this to me. Now you repent for all the negative things you have said about Adam in your frustration. Because you as an authority in his life, The devil is taking your words and using them as testimony in the courts of heaven against him. Because you're an authority, not anybody can just do this, because I'm an authority in his life, the things I have said in frustration to his mother, not even to him, The devil heard those words, takes those words, and as the accuser says, even his own father says this about him. So I began to repent before the throne of heaven for the things I had said that actually had given the enemy ammunition to use against Adam in the courts of heaven. Just began to repent of all that. I repented and repented and repented. Everything I could think of and everything the Lord brought to my mind, I repented of. When I got through with that, I felt a release. And then I heard the Lord say, now now began because that's all been broken, now began to declare his destiny. And I knew some things God had said because on the day he was born, the Lord has said to me how beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of those that bring good news. So I began to prophesy into Adam's spirit like he was just standing before me. I just began to prophesy the destiny. I began to say, awake thou that sleepest, and Christ will give you life. And I just began to prophesy things into his life until I felt a release. It probably took me maybe 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes. I don't even know. Been praying for two years. And I was done. One and a half weeks later, a week and a half later, Adam calls me. And he said, Dad, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. He says, I don't know what happened. This is literally what he said. I don't know what happened. But a week and a half ago, all the depression left, and I'm now ready to pursue what God has for me. He is now on staff in Seattle, Washington, as the adult pastor in a very strong, growing church with great favor on his life, and he's going after what God has for him. But watch this. Watch, please hear me. What two years of praying could not do on a battlefield, 15 minutes in a courtroom did. 
Did you hear what I just said? 15 minutes did. Now, I'm not saying it's always going to be that quick, but the Bible says he will avenge them speedily. Because if we can get legal things in place in the court of heaven, we can win on the battlefield every time. If we can make judgments and get judgments in place, we can win. Now, look with me in Daniel chapter 7. There are many pictures in scriptures of the court system of heaven. There's a very real court system in heaven. Let me just say while you're turning to Daniel chapter 7, as I'm turning there, in Daniel chapter 7, we're going to read verses 9 and 10 because it pictures the court system so clearly. But here's what you need to know. Isn't it interesting that Jesus deals in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 with the ecclesias in the seven churches of Asia Meyer? See, these ecclesias, it means God's judicial, governmental, legislative people. See, let me just cut through the chase. As the ecclesia, we have, been, we have a right to stand in the court systems of heaven and get verdicts from the Lord. If you can hear this, we actually set them in motion. Remember what it says in Revelation 19 and verse 10? The, the, the scripture says in that verse that, that the angel came or the man came and began to unveil to John certain things. And John fell at his, at his feet to worship him. And he picked him up and said, don't worship me. I am of your fellow servants and of your, of your brethren's. Um, I'm just like you. I've just come with a message. And then he says, worship, worship Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. The testimony of Jesus. Do you understand that Jesus from his position in the courts of heaven as mediator and high priest, we'll get to that in just a moment, as mediator, he is actually testifying in the courts. It's his testimony before the courts of heaven. Do you also understand that as he testifies, there is a spirit of prophecy that is released that actually allows us to prophesy in agreement with what he's testifying? That when we begin to prophesy, many times we're not just speaking in the earthly realm. We're actually prophesying things that is in agreement with the testimony of Jesus that is setting the courts in heaven into operation. Now, that was just a freebie. Okay, when we prophesy... We are actually in a spirit of prophecy is on us. We can be in agreement with that which Jesus is testifying because the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. See, in other words, I just need for you to understand, there are things that are set in motion that allows God the legal right to render verdicts in our behalf based on the testimony being given in the courts of heaven. And sometimes we're praying, sometimes we're decreeing, sometimes we're repenting. Sometimes we could be prophesying in agreement with what he's testifying. I mean, we, uh, Apostle Tim and I were talking. And it, well, could it be that sometimes when people like, like, like um, those that have gone before, William Brandon and all this kind of stuff, could it be that what they did when they heard the Lord and they prophesied it actually released a legal reason for God to bless because their prophecies were in agreement with the testimonies of Jesus in the courts of heaven. Just a thought for us to think about. Daniel chapter 7. Verse, I'm sorry. That's right. That's exactly right. We're agreeing with Jesus, and Jesus is agreeing with us. And if two of you agree, it'll be done. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, it says, I watched till thrones were put in place. Daniel seeing this. And the ancient of day was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, as well a burning fire. So let me pause right there. It says thrones, plural, were put in the, in the place in the midst of the throne. We know that the throne is the throne that God, the judge of all, sets on. But there are multiples of thrones here. We know that there are at least 24. I believe there are many, many more. Because in the book of Revelation, the Bible says there's 24 thrones that 24 elders sit on. 
Jesus said in Luke chapter 22 to his apostles, you are those who have continued with me in my tribulation. I will give you 12 thrones to set up on, and you'll judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So I personally believe that the apostles are on 12 of these thrones. Probably representatives of the 12 tribes of Israel up on the other 12 thrones. Now, I can't prove that, but I do know this. I know they are of human origin because they have crowns on their head, and only humans have crowns because of their faithfulness to the Lord in the earth realm. Because the Bible says, Paul said, there's a crown of righteousness laid up for him. James chapter 1 says there's a crown of life for those who endure temptation. In other words, what does it mean? It means these guys have won positions in the courts of heaven. They have won positions in the courts of heaven. See, Jesus won his position in the courts of heaven. It wasn't given him. He won it by his faithfulness to the Father in human form in the planet. And God has given him a name better than every other name. And he is literally literally in the court system of heaven as our high priest. Now, let me just pause and say this. I'm just throwing a lot of things at you, but let me just say this. What was the job of the high priest? The job of the high priest in, in the Old Testament was to offer offerings that granted God the legal right to bless his people. That was the whole job of the high priest. It was to offer offerings that granted God the legal right to bless his people rather than have to judge them. On the day of atonement, they would go in behind the veil, and the high priest would, would, would sprinkle the blood and pour out the blood, and the blood of the bulls and the goats would testify... In the courts of heaven, because of what the high priest had done, and the offering of the high priest of that blood would grant God the legal right to roll the sins back for one more year so that he could keep blessing his people instead of judging them. That was the whole job of the priesthood, to grant God the legal right to bless rather than judge. How many of you know we are kings and priests to our God? Do you know that even we, our job as priest, is to grant God the legal right to show mercy rather than judge? I touched that this morning. I want you to hear something. It is God's heart always to bless and always to be merciful. He just has to have a legal right to do it. It's always his heart. Ezekiel 22.30, God said, I sought for a man to stand in the gap and make up the breach, but because I couldn't find one, I had to release judgment. But, he's, but his intent was not to release judgment. His intent was to show mercy. God wants to show mercy. He wanted to show mercy to Sodom and Gomorrah. But he couldn't find a governmental people that would grant him the right to show mercy, so he had to judge. We are that governmental people. It is our job to go into the courts of heaven and grant God the legal right in agreement with all that Jesus has and is doing to, to grant, us, grant God the legal right to be merciful to us as his people and even the people of nations. That's our job. That's what we're here for. Now that all, that all, if, you, if you have any ounce of intercession in you, that ought to stir your heart. It is God's heart to show mercy. See, this this answered questions for me. This answered, God is good. All good gifts come from him. Then why does bad happen? Because no one gave him the legal right to show mercy. Let me just, I got to tell you this dream right now. Back last, not this November, the past November, but the November before, I began to teach this. I had a dream one night. And in the dream, Dutch Sheets, uh, which is, he's my friend, he, he had written, I saw in the dream, his wife Cece had sent me in the dream, sounds crazy, but it sent me in the dream, his official response to 9-11 when it happened. 
It was Dutch's official response to 9-11 when it happened. I don't even know what it said because what the, what the important thing in the dream was, was right below his official response, Cece had handwritten what she had seen in the courts of heaven that had allowed 9-11 to occur. And here's what she saw. This was in my dream. She saw that just like there are four living creatures before the throne of God saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, there were demonic counterparts to those four living creatures that were saying before 9-11, Bach denied, B-O-C, Bach denied, Bach denied. These living creatures saying, holy, 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 these are saying, Bach denied, Bach denied, Bach denied. And I woke up. Bach denied, B-O-C. I knew it was B-O-C. I didn't know anything better, so I Googled B-O-C. You know what the first thing comes up? Body of Christ. Here's what the Lord was saying. The principalities over nations had gone before the courts of heaven and had legal reason to say, we deny the body of Christ their rights. And on the basis of that denial, because there was no ecclesia to plead their case in the courts, God had to allow 9-11 to occur, even though it was not his heart. His heart is mercy. That's what I saw in the dream. Now, I didn't manufacture that. I'm using that to say, we hold the key to nations. Not just individual things, not just my son, to nations, if I can get legal things in place. So there is a throne with multiple thrones in the courts of heaven. And then it says this, verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth before him, a thousand thousands ministered to him, Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. We see that again in Revelation and so forth. The court was seated. The court of heaven was seated. And I love this. The books were open. Okay, so what does that mean? That means every decision the court is going to make is going to come out of what's in the books. Do you understand that the books of heaven, among other things, the scrolls and books in heaven, the books of heaven contain the destinies of individuals all the way up to nations? Revelation 11, John was told to eat a scroll and then prophesy to nations. See, what was he saying? He's saying, eat this scroll. Eat what's written in the chronicles of heaven about this nation and they began to prophesy the kingdom purpose of that nation into place. And by the way, let me just say this. I believe that the book of Revelation is all about courtroom activity that is granting God the legal right to reclaim the planet. Why? Because after Jesus deals with the ecclesia, and tries to bring them to a place of perfection so they can stand governmentally before the throne of heaven, and they have the right to be there. John is caught up into the throne. What's the first thing he sees in Revelation 5? After he sees the throne and all the happenings around it in the court system of heaven, he sees a book that's sealed with seven seals. And he begins to weep and cry because nobody's found worthy to open the book. The angel says, don't cry. One has prevailed, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He hath prevailed to open the book. And it says that when he turned to see the lion, he instead saw a lamb in the midst of the throne that had been slain. Here's what you need to get. The roar, the governmental roar of the lion is always discovered in the brokenness of the lamb. Until we come to a deep place of brokenness, We cannot roar out of the government of God effectively. I believe that with every fiber of my being. Now, now, but, but here's the deal. John was weeping. Why was he weeping? Because he knew that the court system of heaven he was standing in the midst of could not operate until that book was open. 
See, because the court is seated and the books are open. If the books are shut, the court has no basis on which to render verdicts. I'm going to help you here for just a few moments. So he said, John understood, if this book isn't unsealed, isn't unlocked, then the court cannot render verdicts that will grant God the legal right to reclaim the planet, and the devil will win. But what happened? The books became unlocked. The seals were broken. And what happens? Judgments began to come out of those books that the finality of them all was to grant God the legal right to reclaim the planet as verdicts from the courts of heaven. But what opens books? Well, we know Jesus has prevailed, but notice the tears of John played a part in opening these books. See, until until we come to that place of brokenness, there's something about brokenness and tears quite often that unlock and unseal books that are closed. Now, why is this important? Because I, I, I have whole teachings on this, but I want to just cover the basics. So stay with me for just a moment. So in these books that are in heaven are the destinies of people, individuals, uh, Psalms 139, verse 16, all the way up to nations. It is what God wrote. No, probably need to go here. It's what God wrote in the books before the foundations of the earth about each one of us and about nations. Natasha does a great teaching on this called the sod of God that was the counsel. The word sod is the counsel of the Lord and that there was the counsel in heaven, probably many of it, but before time began, and there was a chronicling and a decision that was made about what each one of us, the part we would play in God's kingdom purpose. She has a tremendous teaching on it and that perhaps we were all there as spirit beings before we came to the earth. I do too. Thank you for saying that. I do too. Here, let me tell you why I believe that. It's consistent with our pattern, which is Jesus. He knew he came from God. He knew he went to God. Now, he was, he was God. We were spirits. Before the, and Jewish culture and rabbis teach that we were within that council of God and we actually agreed to be born in the time we were born in and to accomplish the purpose we were assigned to and we signed it and said we would do that. And then we come to earth and we forgot it. We don't know it, but it's ordained of God. So there was a council that, watch this, I'm going to prove this to you. There was a council that decided that. Then out of that council there were books written. Out of the council, there were books written about our destiny based on what was decided in the council. Okay? And then we come to earth and all things happen. Now, Romans 8, what does it say? Whom he foreknew, that's council. He predestined. That's when it was written in the book. Whom he foreknew, he predestined. Out of the council, it was predestined when it was written in the book. We have a predestined plan for our life that is written down in a book of heaven concerning us. He foreknew, he predestined. What did he do next? He called. That's when we start getting glimpses of what's in our book. The call is when I start getting glimpses of what's in my book. Whatever the call is. Whom he called, he justified. This is where it gets sticky. What's justification? That's courtroom activity. Now watch, that's where we refute every word of the accuser that's telling God why we can't have what's in our book. I'm going to prove it to you in just a moment. And then whom he justified, in other words, legal things get in place so I can now legally have what's in my book. And nations can have what's in their books. And Shreveport can have what's in its book. He glorified. And that's the realm called convergence where everything begins to come together and all of a sudden we're walking out and living out our kingdom purpose and destiny and God's will is being done. We prophesy of the book. Absolutely. In agreement with the book. When a prophet really prophesies, whether they're sin, they are prophesying out of the books of heaven. I always say when Chuck and Dutch went around America prophesying over each state, they were prophesying out of the books. 
The problem is you can prophesy out of the books the kingdom destiny of a state, but if there is no ecclesia to take what is prophesied and take it into the courts of heaven, then nothing becomes of it. I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but watch this. Let me prove this thing about foreknowledge, predestined. There's tape series out there. Foreknowledge, predestined, called, justified, glorified. Getting what's in our books. That's the process of getting what's in our books into the earth realm. Let me say it to this way. I love this. We all know that Jesus is the word made flesh. John 1, 14. What does that mean? Most of us don't have a clue what that means. It's just a good verse to talk about at Christmas time. And I'm not telling you I know exactly at everything, but here's what I do know. Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 7, says of Jesus. Jesus is saying this himself in Psalms, and it's recorded in Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 7. I have come, O God, to do your will. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. In the volume of the book, 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 it's written of me. I have come, O God, to do your will. He said, burnt offering and sacrifice you didn't desire, but a body you have prepared for me. I have come, O God, to do your will. It is written to me in the volume of the book. So here's what we need to understand. Everybody has a book in heaven, including Jesus. There was a foreknowledge in the council, and Jesus agreed, as God, to do certain things in the earth. So there's a book about Jesus. And he said, in my body that you made for me, I have come to fulfill what's written in the volume of the book concerning me. So what does it mean, the word made flesh? Watch. It means that what was written in the books of heaven, that was the word written in heaven, Jesus came into the earth to flesh out. He is the word made flesh. We are also to be the Word made flesh. That we are to live out what is written in the books about us. How many of you know there was a great battle concerning Jesus living out what was written in the books about him? The enemy tried everything within his power to destroy anything that would allow that to happen. But Jesus won. He is the Word made flesh because he fulfilled what was written in the, in the volumes of the books in heaven about him. He fleshed it out in the earth. We have books in heaven, and we, we are to flesh out in the earth what is written about us in the books of heaven. That's what, a part of what these books are. Now, why is that important? What does that have to do with courtroom activity? The court is seated, and before it can move into its activities, its, pro, its proceedings, the books have to be open because the verdicts the court is going to render is going to allow what's in the books to become reality. So if we're going to get our destinies that are written in the books, we have to know how to operate in the court. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34. Very familiar scripture. The Bible says that Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I pray for you that your faith will not fail. And when you're converted, strengthen your brother. And we know that scripture. But we probably don't know this. The word desired there has desired to have you, that whole phrase there. It literally, just look it up in the Strong's. No big depth of trying to make something mean something. It literally says when you look it up, has demanded you be put on trial. Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded you be put on trial. Why? Because Satan somehow or another knows at least some of what's written in Peter's book. And he knows if he doesn't disqualify him in the courts of heaven from getting what's in his book, Peter is going to do massive damage to the kingdom of darkness. So his ploy to stop Peter is to disqualify him in the courts 
from getting the destiny that is written in his books so that he cannot flesh out in the earth what is written in the books about him. So here's what you need to understand. When it says he's de- he has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, it means he wants to tear you to pieces with accusations before the court. He has, he has, watch this, I don't have time, but Ezekiel 28 says that Lucifer was on the fiery stones in the mountain of God, walking back and forth. When you see him in the book of Job, bringing accusation against Job. What's he doing? Going to and fro. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 5. It says that our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So here's what what we have to understand about that. Satan's walking about is about gathering evidence against us. Why? Because he said he's walking about seeking whom he may devour. He's building cases against us to present in the courts of heaven to disqualify us from what's written in our books. And that can be everything from our own personal sin to sins of our bloodline that, had, that he has a legal right to use against us until we apply the blood of Jesus from the cross into those situations. God wants what's in our books to be realized. But the devil is going to seek to disqualify us by legal activity before the court. That's why he demanded that Peter be put on trial. Because if he could bring enough accusations that no one could answer, Peter would be disqualified from fleshing out what was written in his book. Here's the good news. Jesus said, but I have prayed for you. And you're going to make it, Peter. I have been into the courts and I have gotten verdicts in your behavior, I, in, your, in your behalf. I have answered the accusations. Now, you say, well, that's Jesus. No, this was before he won his place in the courts. When he went into the courts, he did it as a mortal man, not as God. How do I know that? Because if in his, in his human life on the earth, if Jesus ever touched his godhood, he disqualified himself from being our Savior. Because a man lost creation, a man had to win it back. That's why the devil comes to Jesus in the the wilderness and says, if you be what? The son of God, command these stones to be made bread. The issue wasn't the stones that would be made bread. The issue was the power he would use to do it. Would he use his godhood to turn stones to bread or would he learn to live his life as a man filled with God? There's a big difference. See, every miracle Jesus did, he did as a man filled with God, not as God. Because if he ever did one thing as God while he lived on the planet, he disqualified himself from being our Savior. Now, why is that important? Because when he is praying for Peter here, he's still in his humanity. So when he said, I prayed for you, he did not do it as our high priest. He did not do it as the one who won the position. He did not do it as the exalted Lord. He did it as a human being. Why is that important? Because that means we can do it. That means we can go into the court and we can get verdicts that set people free from depression. In 15 minutes that that two years wouldn't do. Or we can go into the court and get verdicts for nations. Or we can go into the court and get verdicts for our family. Whatever it may be, we can get verdicts in place that grants us the legal right to now march onto the battlefield and win every time. And get what's written in our books. Is that halfway clicking with you? I'm not going to get everywhere I wanted to get. Let me just show you one more scripture in, in Daniel 7, verses 25 through 27, just to show you the power of this court. And he shall speak pompous words against the Most High 
shall persecute the saints of the Most High, high and shall intend to change law, times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hands for time and times and half a time. Now, we think about the Antichrist and all that, but for just a moment, I just want you to not think about the Antichrist as much as maybe even the Antichrist spirit that's in the earth because John said it's already here. So, so he says that there's going to be this spirit and its intention is to war against the purposes of God. And the saints are going to be given in his hands for time and times and half times. Verse 26, but the court shall be seated. And they, the court, shall take away this Antichrist, his dominion, to consume and destroy forever. Then the kingdom and dominions and the greatness of the kingdom of the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High God. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve him. So here's the deal. Watch what happens here. The saints go from a place of defeat to a place of dominion by one verdict from the courts. One verdict out of the court of heaven caused the saints to go from a place of being defeated to a place of absolute dominion because of a legal rendering from the court. And nobody yelled at the devil. I'm not against yelling at the devil. He needs to be yelled at. But only from proper legal footing. Can I go just, can I go a little deeper? <laughs> just, just for a few minutes. I just want to give you one. I'm just going to touch these things. Isaiah chapter, well, first of all, Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24. There are many voices in the courts of heaven. If you go into a literal court here in our nation, you're going to find many different voices in that court system. Judges, attorneys, bailiffs, witnesses, all sorts of things. Recorders, all sorts of things operating in the courts of, of, this, of our nation. And let me, just, let me just put this to you, too. There are varying levels of courts in, in the court systems of heaven. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 7, I believe it is, that Zechariah was prophesying to Joshua the high priest. He was given clean robes and clean turbans so that the enemy had no reason to resist him that God was using to rebuild Jerusalem. It says, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. It wasn't even that he had chosen Joshua the high priest. Joshua the high priest was simply the vehicle, the vessel that God was using to, to accomplish his kingdom purposes. And he was unclean. That gave the enemy legal right to accuse him and resist, not just him, but the purposes of God through him. We don't understand how important holiness is sometimes. Say, Lord, help me. Because holiness steals away our right, or, or lack of holiness steals away our right of operating in the courts of heaven. So when we go into the courts of heaven, the first thing I have to do is... Answer every accusation being used against me. Because the devil will come and say, he can't do this because of this in his life. So, just lay that aside for just a moment. So, Joshua the high priest has said, right, and then the Bible says, if you will walk before me, among other things, he said, I'll give you charge of my courts, plural. So he's saying to Joshua the high priest, which is a legal position, that his job is to offer up sacrifices to grant God the legal right to have sustained blessings on his people. He says, if you'll walk before me, I'm going to let you operate and even have charge in my courts, plural. See, in our nation, we have criminal courts, small claims courts, you know, all sorts of courts up to the Supreme Court. Did you know there's only a handful of attorneys that can operate in the Supreme Court? It's all based on their jurisdiction that they have been granted. We have to understand not everybody is called to war for nations in the courts. If I am not apostolically assigned to war for nations in the court, I better not try to take principalities and powers to court because they know I don't have a jurisdiction to be there. See, this is where some intercessors get in trouble sometimes. 
they feel they can even feel the passion of God for something, but they don't have the legal jurisdiction to attempt to accomplish it. And, and, and we can allow ourselves to be pulled into dimensions that the enemy now understands they're out of their jurisdiction. They are legally mine. I can go after them. It's very important you stay within your legal jurisdiction in the courts of heaven. That's exactly right. See, what, what can grant you some legalities and some jurisdiction is how you are connected and aligned apostolically. See, that alignment apostolic. See, you look at the Apostle Paul, and he's actually giving the church's prayer agendas from his apostolic position. And he's saying, you pray for this and pray for this. Now, let me just make a clarification. I can pray for nations and speak blessings over them, but if I start engaging principalities, that's a completely different situation. I can bless nations, I can pray for, pray for leaders of nations, but if I step into a court system and begin to wrestle with principalities, that is a position that is reserved for apostles and those correctly aligned and commissioned by those apostles. That's my own personal belief. And I'm speaking from experience. I have been into places I didn't need to be in years gone by. And I'm going to tell you something. It's no fun. And I didn't even know what was going on. Now I do. So I'm very careful about where I tread in the realms of the Spirit. Because there are, mul- there are levels, of course. Now, I said all that to say this. Hebrews 4.16 says that we are to come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. This is a court system that all of us can come into. The throne of grace and mercy is a court system to get very easily get very... See, whenever I went into the court system of heaven in behalf of my son, that was the court setting I went into. I wasn't warring for nations. I wasn't dealing with principalities and powers over cities. I was simply trying to set my son free from whatever was holding him. And that was in the throne of grace. And when I knew what to do and how to do it at the leading of the Spirit, we got instantaneous results. So everybody can come into this court system, the throne of grace court system, if you will. So let me just show you this right quickly. I just need to do this. Hebrews 12, 23 through 24. But you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God, to heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Listen, there are eight things, and there's one more. There are actually nine voices in the courts of heaven that it is our job to come into an agreement with. That we as individuals and as humans and as the ecclesia then began to grant God the legal right as judge to fulfill his father's passion. And if you'll just let me go for just a few moments. You say, well, how do you get that? The the key here is this word, you have come to Mount Zion. And I'm just going to brush past this, but in Isaiah chapter 2... It says that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains. In other words, there is a governmental mountain that will rule over all of the mountains. And any time you read about mountains, you're reading about governments. So there is the mountain of the Lord in the tops of the mountains that is determining what goes on in these other mountains. And then it says, and the people will say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of our God, so forth and so on. And it says, and out of of Zion shall go forth the law and Jerusalem the word. So here's the deal. Verse 3 actually identifies the mountain that's in the top of the mountains. Its name is Zion. And so when God says, you have come to Mount Zion, he's saying, you have stepped into my governmental place. You have stepped into my court system. You have stepped into the dimension where where verdicts come from because that's what Zion is. See, isn't it amazing? We keep trying to get places God says we've already come to. We as New Testament believers 
are supposed to be living our lives out in this place called Zion. Because if you go ahead and read in verse 4 of Isaiah 2, it says that from Mount Zion he will judge nations. In other words, judicial activity comes out of Zion. Now I'm just brushing past it real quick, but what I want you to see is that Zion is a reference to the governmental place that we have come to, which is the court system of heaven. And we know that, among other reasons, because the rest of these things mentioned here are legal. God, the judge of all. A mediator, which is a legal entity. The blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. In other words, the, and I'll share this just a moment, is giving testimony. See, all of these things mentioned are voices in the courts that we are to come into an agreement with. And when we do, we grant God the legal right to fulfill his Father's passion. And let me just run through these. I'm going to do them really quick. I want to go in verse, reverse order in verse, beginning in verse 24. It says, you have come to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. In other words, blood gives testimony. How do we know that? He talks about Abel. In Genesis chapter 4, when Cain kills Abel, God comes to Cain and says, where is your brother Abel? He said, I'm my, my, my brother's keeper. And he says, what have you done for the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground? And then the very next um, verse says, you will be a fugitive and a vagabond. God sentenced Cain on the basis of the testimony of Abel's blood. There was a verdict that came out of heaven against Cain based on what the blood of Abel was testifying. Blood testimony gets results. The Bible says that we have a better better blood, a better sacrifice. It's the blood of Jesus. And his blood is crying out for our redemption, for our restoration, for our forgiveness, but it's also crying out for the purpose that it was spilt for, which is God reclaiming the whole earth back to himself. That blood is still crying in the courts of heaven. So when I go into the courts of heaven, listen, they overcame the accuser by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives and their death. So whenever I go into the courts of heaven, I fully come into an agreement with everything the blood is saying about me. Anything I need forgiveness for, anything I need cleansing for, anything I need to repent for, I repent and I ask for the blood to purge it. I come into an agreement with the voice of the blood that's testifying in my behalf before the courts of heaven. Does that make sense to you? Because without the blood, I have no ability to stand in the courts of heaven. Only by the blood can I stand in the courts of heaven. I had time to go into Isaiah 43, but we don't have time. But, so it says, the, what, the first voice I want to mention is the blood. The second voice is to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. The word mediator is a legal term. Anybody ever been into a court case where you're going to go and there's a suit going on and before you go into that court case, the judge demands you go before a mediator? Why? To see if you can come to an agreement so you don't have to bother the court. That's what mediators do. I've I've seen this happen several times where they, they go into mediation and if they come to an agreement, then all the judge does is put his stamp of approval on it and call it legal. But the purpose of the mediator of the new covenant is Jesus, and he functions as our mediator for the purpose of bringing God and us together so he can legally release to us all the promises of the new covenant. See, if you're not getting the promises of the new covenant, it's because something legal is resisting you from getting them. There's an accusation the enemy is using to stop it. Just letting that soak in. And I don't have time to go through all this, but number twenty, uh, verse 23, we have come to the spirits of just men made perfect. That's the, among other things, the great cloud of witnesses. These, the, these are those that have died and gone on. They are not on a cloud playing a harp. They are actually have positions in the courts. Some of them are among the multitude worshiping. 
Some of them have won positions in the court. The best way I know how to describe this. It's amazing how in our, in our southern evangelical traditions, what we make heaven to be about. When it is full of great activity, and just because somebody dies and goes to heaven doesn't mean they stop their kingdom purpose of existence. They just step into the next realm. I don't know if Natasha's never, never explained this, but there's a, there's a guy named David that's there in South Africa that's one of the seer guests, great young man. The first time I went, he's running around doing all the stuff, everything. Next time I go, they got a bed, a hospital bed in the back, and David's in this hospital bed because he has been in a horrendous wreck and should have died. The next time I come, he's in a wheelchair. I've been there so many times, and I've watched him just from stage to stage. Now he's up moving around and walking. But the truth is, the accident he was in, which was a car accident, everybody knew he should have died, and he was in a coma. While he was in this coma, he suddenly was in the courtroom of heaven. And the debate going on in the courtroom of heaven was should David come on to heaven or should he be allowed to fulfill what was written in the books about him? And let's stay in the earth. And this was the debate going, in the, going on in the court system of heaven. And David said, suddenly, out of nowhere, a man with a long white beard showed up. He was very gentle. He was very meek. And he began to give reasons in the court why David should be allowed to go back to the earth and finish his destiny. And on the basis of that man's testimony, the court rendered a verdict that said he could stay alive in the planet and fulfill his destiny. It's written in the books. And he's well. He's healed. He's recovered. But here's the deal. After that man gave his testimony, and David's still in this court system and in the coma, the man turns to leave the court. And David cries to him and says, Sir! And the man just keeps going. He says, sir. And he calls him finally a third. Says, sir. Finally, the man stops. And he turns and looks at him. And he says, David says to him, sir, what is your name? Because this man has just got a verdict in his behalf. He said, what is your name? I think maybe he asked him a third time, what is your name? And suddenly the man said, my name is Noah. And turned around and walked off. Somebody says, well, that can't be true. Really? Ezekiel 14, when, God, when Ezekiel is prophesying about the devastation that will come to Israel, God said, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job, I think it was, should stand before me, I wouldn't even do it for them. But what that says is that these, pe these people are already dead when Ezekiel's prophesying this. So they have a tremendous place in the courts of heaven or God wouldn't have mentioned them. Are you getting this? <laughs> He's a lawyer. See, here, my point is this. You know, I have, no re I have no way of validating that other than to say this. We have come to the spirits of just men made perfect. They are still crying out for what they laid their lives down for. We have loved ones, I believe, that are in the court systems of heaven. They are not on a cloud playing a harp. They are, the Bible says they without us cannot be made perfect. So they're a part of this system and its operation. Let me give you the next one. It says, we have come to God, the judge of all. Now, isn't it interesting that in this verse, it doesn't call him Father or Savior or Lord. It calls him judge. Why? Because this is the courtroom setting. And the Lord said to me, Teach my people that they must grant me as judge the legal right to fulfill my father's passion. Let me explain it to you this way. I went into the, the, the bedroom of a man, his wife, who was dying of cancer. She was 43 years old and had a 13-year-old daughter. And she had cancer, breast cancer, that had spread across her body. Here's the deal. Her mother, her mother had died of the same, I mean, identical disease at 43 years old when she was 13. 
clearly a family curse. Clearly a generational issue operating here. And I laid my hands on this woman's head, and I felt the Father's passion to heal her. I'd felt it. I felt it many times. I felt his passion to heal her, and in 12 hours, she was dead. What I didn't know was that she and her husband had gotten into a great place of dishonor and stealing away that which belonged to another person because they had been given a position that enabled them to do that and trusted with it. And when they got into that place, please hear me, it gave that curse a legal right to land. So we could have prayed until whenever... And she would have never been healed until there was repentance that had allowed that curse to land. When it says it's like a fleeting sparrow and a flying swallow, it means it's circling, waiting for something legal to let it land. Are you following me? I personally believe this is the reason so many people don't get healed, don't see breakthrough. It's because there's still something legal resisting God from doing what he wants to do. Because this is what the Lord said to me. I can never compromise myself as judge to fulfill my father's passion. Because then that would make me less than God. He's judge of all. That's why I say it's our job to get everything in place that grants him the legal right as judge to fulfill his father's passion. His father's passion is always mercy, always life, always redemption. But if he doesn't have a legal right to do it, he he has to allow nature and even demonic forces to take their toll because he has no legal right to stop it and we can pray and we can cry and we can i have just given you the reason why bad things happen to good people that's why bad things happen the devil can't just do anything he has to have a legal right to do it and he uses our ignorance he uses our lack of discernment He uses all that stuff against us. But the bottom line is if we can discern, if we can understand, if we can discern the legalities that's allowing this thing to work, we can get that thing moved out of the way by the provisions of the cross, put it in place, move it out of the way, and grant God now the legal right is judged to fulfill the Father's passion that he so desperately wants to fulfill. And that's on a personal level, and that's on a national level, that's on every level. That's our job. That's our job, is to give him that right. Is this making halfway sense? Because he is God, the judge of all. And he will do righteously. Remember, that's why he brought Abraham into the equation. Why? Somebody give me the legal right to heal. Somebody give me. My wife, years ago, when we were functioning so strong in the healing ministry, we we were seeing wonderful things, but we were seeing some people not healed, obviously. And my wife had a dream, and this is what the Lord said to her in a dream. She heard the voice of the Lord say, if you do not pray for them correctly, they will die. We didn't even know what that meant. We thought, what does that mean? Now I feel like I have some semblance of an understanding. If there are legal things that is allowing a sickness to operate, and it, could be a, it can even be a myriad of things. If there's a legal reason it has to operate, you can't get them healed until you get that legal thing moved out of the way. And the truth of the matter is if they get healed, Apostle Tim and I are talking about this, on the basis of somebody else's faith, it's a strong likelihood that that thing will come back because it still has a legal right to be there. So we have to get those things moved out of the way So that God now has a legal right to release healing in a sustained measure. It's not just healing, it's every realm. But God is the God, he is the judge of all. Let me run through this other very quickly. He said, we have come to the general assembly. Just real quickly, that literally means universal companionship, mass meeting. It is a picture of the multitudes around the throne that are worshiping. 
Worship is an integral part to the court system of heaven. See, worship is an integral part. What happens? See, when we worship, we step into a governmental dimension. And this is what we as the ecclesia are learning how to do. In the midst of our worship, we then move into a place where we can operate governmentally. See, David created Zion, the place that the tabernacle was set up, and had 24-hour-a-day worship. Why did David do that? Everybody thinks Zion is about worship. Zion is not about worship. Zion is about a cultivation of the presence from which David could govern a nation. He understood that. So he wanted the presence of God about him so that out of this place called Zion, he could begin to govern a nation. And so when we worship, we are stepping into the dimensions of heaven and we're stepping into the court system of heaven from which we can see verdicts rendered. Just... A lot of things we could say there, but let me move on. We have come to the firstborn, the church of the firstborn, registered in heaven. What does that mean? That means there is a church, there is an ecclesia that is recognized in heaven. Why is that important? Because it's all about jurisdiction. See, some ecclesias are supposed to govern a city. Others are to govern states. Others are to govern nations. It's about jurisdiction. It's about where we're recognized in heaven. Let me make this point this way. When you go back into Revelation chapter 2, the Bible says that the church of Ephesus was warned, if you don't repent of leaving your first love, Jesus said, I'll come and take the candlestick away. See, what was the candlestick? Well, go back and search it out. It was... The two olive trees are the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah's anointing that was being released, that was feeding these candlesticks. What is Moses? Moses had a a governmental authority that delivered a nation. Elijah had a governmental authority that turned a nation back to God. It was about nations. And so Jesus was saying, if you don't repent, that which is, is flowing in you that causes you to be an ecclesia registered in heaven, that gives you rights to operate in heaven and see verdicts come out of heaven that grants God the legal right to do what he wants to do. If you don't repent of having left your first love, I'm going to come and take that candlestick away. Watch this. And the earth will still consider you a church, but heaven won't. It's possible for the earth to say we're something that heaven doesn't recognize. There are many churches today. They have church on the door, but they're not ecclesias that are recognized in heaven. Just think about it. This is an ecclesia. You're recognized in heaven. You have a jurisdiction that heaven op- uh, recognizes. It's saying, come on, step into the courts of heaven. And somebody says, well, I don't know if I can do this. No, listen, when we don't know how to pray as we ought, the Spirit helps us. Thank God for the Spirit. See, I, sometimes I teach this, and some, some, I've had some leaders say, oh, he's just trying to preach another gimmicky way to pray. I said, no, I'm not either. I'm looking for some results. I'm looking for understanding how to get legal things in place that grants God the legal right to fulfill his passion. I'm almost through. To an innumerable company of angels. There are, I mean, I've heard different ones teach it. I mean, I consider them right to teach. There's ten different ranks of angels. I, I, when I teach sometimes, I just teach that there's you know, at least four of those ranks that are operating in heaven, and they all have functions. Let me give you, let me, sometimes I share what I shared about the... Um, um, what I saw in the dream where the, the demonic powers and the heavenly powers were releasing their testimonies before the courts and God had to allow 9-11 to occur. It came out of the renderings of the court. But one of the jobs of some of the angels are this. See, and I'll just touch this. In Zechariah chapter 5, Zechariah sees a scroll, a flying scroll that's carrying a judgment. Now, Zechariah is prophesying during a restoration period. So in his, in, his, in his scroll, he sees it and is flying, but as it begins to land, it enters houses and it judges thieves and perjurers. 
It judges thieves and perjurers. Why? Because obviously there were thieves and perjurers that were hindering the process of restoration that God was after. So Zechariah sees this, but he sees it because an angel awakens him to see it. So here's what I believe. I believe that when we, I mean, I teach this, that when we function as the ecclesia in the courts of heaven, not only do we grant God the legal right, but there are verdicts that come out of heaven that are scrolls. They're scrolls. And it is also our job as the ecclesia not only to get the verdicts out of heaven, but then to land those scrolls that allows what God released out of heaven to become reality in the earth. See, these scrolls were landed and judgments began to come. See, listen, people don't like the word judgment. Listen, you can't have justice without judgment. It's impossible. If we want justice, see, judgment is not necessarily the activity of an angry God. Judgment is decisions coming out of heaven that are setting things in place and moving out of the way everything that's hindering God's kingdom will. That's what happened in Zechariah 5. And angels were a part of that process of these things being landed. So here's what we try to do. Once we discern we have had had something released, we also go through the process of landing that scroll. We say, Lord, let what you have released out of heaven, let it land. Let me give you one testimony. I'm I'm almost through. Please just hang with me because I've gone this far. I might as well finish. Okay. There was, there was a lady that came to us. Her, her daughter had, was going on trial the next day. She lived, we we're in Colorado. She lives out on the East Coast. And the reason she was going on trial was because her and her husband had got into an argument. She, he had taken off in one car. She had jumped in the other car, and it eventually rammed his car. When the police came, they realized what would happen. They took her into custody, and they charged her with attempted murder. Well, I mean, she shouldn't have done that, obviously. Let me, let me, before I finish that story, let me tell you a personal story. When our kids were really, really little, Mark was really little, Mary and I were coming back from a basketball game. She was in the minivan, and I was in my red Mustang. We had gotten past what I described to you this morning. So I'm in my red Mustang, and I remember we're coming, we're merging on the traffic. It's January, and I shifted down, and I looked back. There was nothing coming, and I stepped on the gas. Well, I didn't know that Mary had stopped in front of me letting a car pass, even, even though there was a lane to merge into. And I nailed her, and airbags came out. And kids, well, there was a, one of them in the back seat, I think maybe it was Mark, wasn't buckled in and came coming. I threw my arm up. Long story short, I totaled my car and did, did massive damage to the minivan. The police had to be called to make a police report. So when they come, it's, I'll never forget, it was January. It's cold. We're standing in the greater ditch. I can say that here. You guys know what that is. I'm standing in the ditch, and all of a sudden, the police separate us. And they, Mary tells me later, they ask her, have y'all been fighting? And Mary said, no, but we're going to. (laughs) It wasn't much of a fight because I didn't have a leg to stand on. So that was my personal story. But but, so this lady has literally maliciously rammed her husband. She's charged with attempted murder. The DA will not let it go, even though the couple got it all worked out and got back together. And so the mother comes and says... They're taking her to trial, and they're going to have jury selection tomorrow and all this kind of stuff. So we be, I began to lead mom through a prayer of bringing her daughter into the courts of heaven. And some of you, I can share some of this here. We have some guys, who have several, had a couple of guys in the church there in Colorado Springs that began because Katie stayed in their house. We know Katie Squires that runs around with Natasha sometimes. Y'all knows her. They had stayed in her house. And all of a sudden after Katie left, these guys started getting numbers. They would get numbers while I was preaching, and it would be exactly what I was preaching out of Strong's Concordance. I mean, they would get these numbers. And so we started using that to operate in the courts of heaven. 
And so, so we went into the courts of heaven. We began to operate here, and they started getting numbers, and we led them. We led mom through all this repentance, and then we asked, began to ask for mercies on the situation. And all of a sudden, there was a, there was a number came up out of Strong's Concordance, and some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but it meant, it meant for a case to be dismissed. That's what it meant. And I knew we'd got our verdict. So we began to land that scroll. We said, we land that verdict out of the courts of heaven. We don't just get it, we land it. And we just broke up and went home. About mid-morning the next morning, when the situation was going on on the East Coast, mom called. And she was so excited she couldn't stand it. She said, they went to court. The judge looked at it and said, this is foolishness, and threw the case out. All because a verdict came out of the court of heaven that was implemented in a natural court, and a scroll was landed. I could tell you more stories, but and I, I use court stories, not, but not because it just only works in courts, but just because it connects things in the legalities. Let me just tell you this last one. Sometimes I hesitate to tell some of these stories about my family because you think, God, they're a mess. But here's my situation. Just raise six kids and see how well you can do. No, all of our, seriously, all of our kids are serving God. Every one of them is serving God with their whole heart. But my oldest son, Ryan, he's 30, 32 years old now. Back probably when he was early 20s, I suppose it was now, he was out doing something, and these guys attacked him. And, and he, they literally did. And they don't want to attack Ryan Henderson. Because I don't know how he learned to do it, but the boy can punch. And he stepped, and he leveled one of them and broke their jaw. Well, even though the guy attacked him, he went and filed an assault charge against Ryan. That ended up being a misdemeanor assault charge because he wanted somebody to pay, pay for his broken jaw. Ryan ended up in court. The judge says, I'm putting you on two years probation um, and da-da-da-da-da, whatever fines and situations he had to come up with. Instead of fulfilling his probation in Texas, he ended up going to Kansas and not taking care of his business. I know none of you have kids like that, but that's just what happened to him. And he went to Kansas and... Ended up meeting a wonderful girl, and they got married, and things are great. I mean, just tremendous stuff as far as that part of it goes. But then, wonders of wonders, the girl graduates from KU, Kansas University, and ends up getting a teaching job in Houston, Texas. So now they've got to move back to Texas, where there is a warrant out for Ryan's arrest. And Ryan calls me. He says, Dad, i got to get this taken care of. I said, I know you do. you got to. I said, you shouldn't have. You, being Dad, you should have never done that. I tried to tell you, but no. So anyway, he contacts the DA office. Talks to, the DA hates him. His, Waco is not a big place. But the assistant DA is okay with him. So he actually talks to the assistant DA. The assistant DA says, here's what we'll do. He said, We'll go in and we'll say to the judge, this is what the guy did, but this is what we want, we want to do. We want him just to spend 10 days in jail, pay some fines, and he'll be able to go on with his life. And, and they said, but the problem is we need to get the right judge. Ryan hired a lawyer, you know this. Okay, the problem was they got the wrong judge. They didn't get the judge they wanted. And this judge is hardcore. This judge... Doesn't play games. He don't like. So, so I take Ryan. I said, Ryan, we got to go to the courts of heaven with this. And he said, okay. So I lead him through. Uh, it's over the phone because he was someplace else. I lead him through. And, and, and we're doing the numbers thing. And all of a sudden, these numbers about violence begins to come out. And I began to lead Ryan through repenting for his violent behavior. Because the, ac- the accuser was using that against him in the courts of heaven. And Ryan, now you have to know my son, he doesn't do this. He broke and started crying. And I knew it was real repentance. And all of a sudden, ver- things started coming out of the courts 
numbers and all sorts of things, that mercy was going to be shown. And, so, and I knew I could sit in my spirit. Things had shifted. We got a verdict out of heaven about this. So the day comes for him to go trial. I fly to Texas and go with him because this is what we're thinking. You know, gonna, the, the, the courts are going to give us what the DAs are asking, which is 10 days in jail, pay the fines, get out, go on with your life. It was a very small price for two years of par- parole violations and all this kind of stuff. So we go into the courts. Ryan Henders is standing there. The judge says, da 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 and his that lawyer says something, and the DA says, well, here's what we recommend. I've given it to you, the judge reads it, and as he reads it, the expression on the judge's face changes. And he says, I don't like this at all. This is a slap on the wrist. Young man, why did you do this? There were parole officers in, in Kansas. And he begins to rip him up one side and down the other. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, it ain't looking good for Ryan. What happened to our court? And all of a sudden, God is my witness. The judge's expressions changed His tone changed, and he said, young man, this is what I'm going to do. No jail time. Pay your fines. I'm giving you your driver's license back because it had been suspended because of it all. You go home. You take care of that wife. You finish school, and I better not see you in this court again. God is my witness. God is my witness. We gave God the legal right to be merciful. He was granted a legal right to be merciful. Do you get that? We've just seen it happen over and over and over again. Let me finish this real quick. We have come to to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. What is that? It didn't take a rocket scientist or a Bible scholar. The angel said, come, I'll show you the Lamb's bride. And he said, he took me up on a high mountain. That name of that mountain is Zion because everything looks different from the governmental perspective. So he takes him up on this high mountain, and he sees the bride as a city coming out of heaven. See, now, as far as I'm concerned, and I know there are many different things we could say about that, that is a depiction of heaven invading earth. But this is what I believe. God wants to reform cities by causing the heavenly to be imposed upon the natural. So that natural cities began to take on the tone of the heavenly. But the thing that allows that is the operation of the bride in the courts of heaven. See, here's what I believe. God wants us to so be in love with him and be his lover that from the bedroom we have courtroom authority. From the place of intimacy with the Lord, our voice carries a weight. See, the way I, one of the ways I picture this, remember whenever David is weak, closing with us, David is weak. I'm sorry I went so long, but David is weak. He's dying. His days are up. And one of his sons tries to take his kingdom again. Bathsheba is sent in by Nathan the prophet. said, you better do something or your head's on the line. And Bathsheba, the lover of David, goes in and says, did you not say that my son Solomon, our son, would be king? Why is this other guy taking the place? And she appealed to David. And David, from his position as king, rendered a verdict that said Solomon would be king as he had promised. But here's the deal. It was Bathsheba, the lover of David, that got the verdict from him. When we know how, as the bride, to operate in the courts of heaven, I believe that the beauty of the bride will begin to be reflected in our cities. That reformation will come so that, watch this, our cities no longer carry the flavor of the principalities that rule them, but the bride will determine what the cities look like. Because right now, principalities are determining what they look like. But when we as the bride take our place, we will cause 
the glory of God to be made manifest within natural cities as the heavenly city is superimposed upon the natural. And it all comes out of verdicts from the courts as we begin to operate there. So there are, and there's, there, those are eight. There are, there are voices in the courts of heaven. So could you stand with me? And I know I went really long. The Holy Spirit will teach us how to do this. I've given you some. We, let, me, let me just tell you one more thing as you're standing. We had a situation in Colorado. I've told you personally. Let me, let me tell you about a governmental thing that happened. We had a situation in Colorado where that they said that we were going to have passed in Colorado another legislation that would allow the state to come in and take children out of the home. And it was, you know how they veil it and all this kind of thing. But what they would be able to do, they would be able to come in if children were being taught Christian principles from a Christian viewpoint, they would consider that legitimate reason to take a child out of the home. And it was, it was on the docket. And they had said, they literally had said, it's, it's going to pass. It's going to pass. I mean, gosh, we just made marijuana li- uh, legal, you know. Um, it's going to pass. That's, that's kind of spirit that's there in that state. And so I remember it was a Wednesday night, and I just said, we just need to take this to court. So I led the group through a court proceeding, led us into the court, and I expected a fight. I literally expected a fight. I expected for the principalities and powers. And to my amazement, when we stepped into the courts, it was like, the most easiest thing we ever did, and I knew we had gotten out of verdict, and the next day the vote was taken, and to everybody's surprise, it didn't pass. Everything. Because we got a verdict out of the court that literally set in order God's kingdom agenda in that situation. So we saw that happen. I've just seen thing after thing after thing. Um, So it's a very real thing. So here's what I feel like I want to do tonight. So just, just, just close. I know we need to go, but how many of you realize you have a book in heaven? Now, I want you to put your hand over your heart. I want you to say these words. Say, Father, right now, I want to thank you for what's written in the books of heaven about me, about my family line. And, Lord, I want to ask that every legal thing that the devil is using to resist what's in my book from being made flesh. I want to ask you, Lord, that these accusations would be answered. I agree with the blood of Jesus. And I ask you, Lord, that the blood would speak in my behalf. Let every kingdom purpose for which I was created... Let it be done. Father, I repent for every place I have granted the devil the legal right to resist me. I ask, Lord, that you would cleanse my bloodline so that there is no legal place for the devil to stop what's written in the books about me. So I just come, Lord. And I repent before you, and I say your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I just come, Lord Jesus, to worship you, to adore you. I agree with your testimony as high priest concerning me and my kingdom will in the name of Jesus. Now, just sense, just let your hands just begin to worship him for just a moment. We just worship you, Lord. We just magnify you, Lord. We glorify you. We thank you for the anointing that breaks every yoke. We thank you for everything to be set in order. We thank you that you you grant us great skill in, in releasing to you as judge the legal right to fulfill your Father's passion. We thank you for doing this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We thank you that everything, and I just sense this, Everything that has resisted us is going to begin to crater and fall as we deal with these things, Lord. Lord, Lord, step by step, piece by piece, as you, as by the Spirit of the Lord, unveils it to us, Lord. Lord, that there's great breakthrough. Lord, not only on a personal level, 
but on a kingdom level as it relates to Shreveport, as it relates to Louisiana, as it relates to the nation of America and to the nations of the earth that you have given this apostolic ecclesia authority in. Father, that there's going to be the ability to go into the courts of heaven and get things in place, Lord, so that there is now a legal right, Lord, to see your will fulfilled in the earth. I thank you for doing this, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you that we get binding contracts in place that allow you the legal right to invade the planet. We dissolve contracts with hell that allows the enemy's powers to be broken and his devices to be, to be removed in the name of Jesus. I want to thank you for doing this, Lord. I want to thank you for doing this, Lord. But I want to thank you, Lord, that the principles that have been released, you just continue to breathe upon and bring revelation. But we just want to say we agree with the intercession of heaven. We agree with all the voices of heaven. We agree with the intercession until all of it becomes a reality. And we thank you for it, Lord. And, Lord, I decree that there is coming breakthrough on new levels over this people, over this house. The things that have been warred for for years are now going to be put into place, Lord. And there is going to be breakthrough, 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 Lord. That 2013 is a year of breakthrough. It's a year of breakthrough and your kingdom purposes. And we thank you for doing it, Lord, in Jesus. Jesus name I say that every family curse that has harassed and haunted the people of this house I decree that you are broken you are removed your legal rights of operation are are, are diminished and are destroyed in Jesus name and father your kingdom will is being done and I thank you for this Lord we bless you Lord we bless you now one more thing just begin to pray in the spirit come on Okay, I want to do one more thing before I turn it back to Apostle Tim. Who, anybody here in the room, you need a job. You're, you, you, if you need a job, come stand here with me. I just felt the Lord said this. If you need a job, yes, you need a job. <laughs> I verify by the Spirit of the Lord that is true. <laughs> okay, I just really sense that some, uh, maybe all of us here, there's something legal. Have, 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 have some of you been looking for a job for an extended period of time? Okay, okay. Unless, I want to set things legally in place that's going to allow God to fulfill, answer your prayer and fulfill his passion, okay? So I want you to just say these words. Say, Father, right now, I thank, just everybody pray with us. Say, I thank you, and Lord, I declare before your courts that I submit myself to you. And any place of rebellion or, or um, uh, entitlement that I have walked in, I repent of. Lord, I just want to say to you that I want to serve you. And so I'm asking you, Lord, and I am agreeing with the blood of Jesus that is speaking in my behalf. And I ask that every accusation that would be resisting me being employed, I ask that the blood cleanse me and answer these accusations. Anything the devil is using, I ask that it be taken out of the way by the blood of Jesus. Now say this, say, Father, I surrender my life. I surrender my heart right now and i ask for favor from your courts that allow me to be employed i declare i have favor in the face of employers that are even coming out of the courts of the lord now father i just want to decree this over them i say that even things are shifting right now and i pray that as they go forth Lord, that there is now favor coming out and every resistant thing is broken that has been used against them. And Lord, they are going to see answers come. Lord, answers come, gainful employment being secured, Lord, so that they can be supported and have the things that are necessary. I say before the courts of heaven, I remind you, Lord, that you said that we should maintain good works. So I decree, Lord, that good works are maintained and the doors are open and there is a provision through employment that now comes over these that stand here, even as they have brought their case 
into the courts of heaven, and everything that resists them is now removed, and the answers are coming now in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Wow. Did your brain fall out tonight? <laughs> We're going to go by and pick them up later, and uh, we'll use them for good. Wow. Scripture is just like popping. As he's preaching, I'm, Scripture is just flying before me to affirm what this is about. And I just, I know it's unusual. I mean, we got to grow in this. Don't, don't uh, go to Supreme Court tomorrow, all right? Just, we got to grow in the revelation. Is I'll say this, just to confirm this. Uh, I was uh, ministering in Oklahoma recently, and before I went, I had a dream. And in the dream, I saw men underground rerouting water pipes everywhere. They were undoing them and rerouting them and everything. And then I saw our president come out, and he had just come from a court. And he had, from this court, decreed that this water would be rerouted. And everybody's like, why did you do this? And he says, I was doing it for your good. You just don't understand. And I'm thinking, wow, what? I don't understand that. You know, I couldn't understand it. So I, I go to Oklahoma to minister, and I'm, I go to the pastor's house to stay in his house. He's out in the rural area. And he says, you're not going to believe what Oklahoma just did out here. The government just did. They've taken away all our water rights, and they won't allow us to have wells or springs here anymore that they're going to run pipes from the city all the way out here to the rural area because they don't want us to have our own water sources. I then knew that that court case that our president was part of, whatever, was decreed something, and they lost their rights. So now I'm going to get him this series because we didn't know what to do about it. I, I just, one sets for me. I just, I feel grace coming this way for that. Anyway, uh, um, I'll trade a book for you, all right? Trade you a book, right? Uh, but I feel like we can begin to decree those things, and we have to be wise when you're in alignment, he talked about that. You've got to get under alignment of authority and really be careful there. Uh, John Paul Jackson wrote a book called Needless Casualties of War. And that book was birthed out of two women in his ministry, young ladies in their 20s, who decided to try to take the principality of New York City down by themselves. And that wasn't John Paul's call. He wasn't called to do that. And they stepped out and tried to pull it down, and both of them died in the same year. Uh, the same thing, both of them died of cancer in their 20s, healthy, nothing wrong with them. They went out to principality, they died. And so he wrote the book, Needless Casualty Wars, on, on, the, on that issue. So we've got to be careful of where you're in alignment. You know, this is a national how. We have nations in this house, so, you know, we're going to begin to deal with issues like that because that's a call over this house. But, you know, if you, if you stay, make sure you understand our alignment or where we are, or if you're not in this ministry, what alignment you're in. Find out where they are because you don't want to step out of that. Like he said, you can pray prayers. Just don't go to court over it. Does that make sense? You want to preach some more? Hang on. <laughs> I can go on and on. Yeah, and I thought about, Susan, I said, you know, there's a cloud of witnesses, witnesses, witnessing, you know, about what, what they're called to do and what we're called to do. So he said, since we have them surrounding us, let us run our race because we got witnesses that can decree for us from the courts of heaven, what we're called to do. Your, fall, your grandfather that saw, didn't walk in his destiny, but he passed it on to you, is a witness before the Lord, and he's witnessing on your behalf, and he's being in decree. He says, so therefore, you need to run your race, because it's not just about you decreeing it. Somebody else else is decreeing it with you. Oh, no, I, I mean, there's a preach anointing here. I don't want to go to it. Father, let us go home tonight. And just grab this revelation. Those of you watching by stream, receive this impartation right now. E even though you're not here with us tonight, some of you in other states and other nations, we just release to you tonight as well the impartation that we received here. I pray that, Father, you teach us your ways as we learn how to deal with this issue. And, Father, that we would grow in this. And, Lord, this is a, a jurisdiction that you've called us to walk in. As the ecclesia, I pray that, Lord, we truly be the, the ecclesia that the gates of hell will not prevail against. 
that, Lord, we'll walk in our anointing for this purpose. Give people tonight dreams and visions. Lord, let the seer anointing fall on them. Let them understand what needs to be dealt with in the courtrooms. Father, I pray for dreams to reveal hidden things that are keeping us bound so that when we have revelation, Lord, we can go with you with that revelation, go to before you with that revelation and decree what you have revealed to us. I pray for a spirit of revelation and understanding to be released upon us tonight. We bless our, our brother, Apostle Robert, and we thank you for what he's brought to us. We receive and we embrace the message tonight. We receive, Lord, the message of revelation and the spirit of revelation that's growing in this house. Come here, Robert. Let's pray over you. Y'all stretch your hands toward him. Father, I thank you for Robert and what he's carrying in this hour. Ah. And, Father, Lord, you're going to take him to another place and and when I put my hand on your shoulder, I heard this word, legislative mandate. And I saw the Lord give you a new mandate of a legislative anointing. Now, I know you just preached that, but I saw it come on you. And this is a mandate from heaven. It was decreed, and I heard this voice echo in the heaven. In other words, it is something that you've cried out for, and now it's coming. And I saw it go into your belly, and it said it will flow out of your belly like a river. And it will begin to come out of your mouth, and it will be a mandate that will actually set a standard for others to walk after. And as it goes forth, the Lord says it will not only be a standard, but it will actually be a, a policy, and it will actually be a book that comes out of this mandate. And it's going to be a whole thing that God's going to teach you how to legislate in this realm. But the mandate is that you must train others. For the Lord said you will never leave this earth until you release this mandate. And so there are many others to train, and it is not to reside in you and you alone. For the Lord said he's going to raise up others who will actually even take it further than you. But nonetheless, you're going to lay the foundation for a greater revelation, for a greater movement within the body of Christ. And so I declare that in the Spirit, I see this in the Spirit, the Lord declares over you that you have the anointing in this season to begin to release this for the next season's ahead. So the Lord says, don't be discouraged by what you see in this season, for you are laying something that's going to change generations down the line. And it's going to be generational, and it will go across the generations, even to the youngest uh, believers. So they will not, you know, this goes to the older and the younger, and it will be cross-generational teaching and understanding. And so I thank you, Lord, and there's going to be an authority that comes with this and an authority that comes through you to begin to release this in this season. So, Father, I thank you that he moves into this legislative mandate season. And, Lord, we receive this mandate from uh, him as well tonight. And we start walking in it. And I ask you to release that revelation in the greater world. Lord, open the prophetic on this man like yes. never before. And that's it. You're going to a new realm of the prophetic. Yes. It's going to be in a way of declarations. And you will actually stand before houses of authority, places of authority, and you will decree from those places just like you are a, a speaker of the house. And the Lord said you will be a speaker of the house and you will decree from that place as one whose vote carries more weight many times than those that are in the house. And so the Lord will release that for you in this season. So, Lord, I bless our apostle friend with that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hey. Uh, that's your job now. Hallelujah. All right, look at your neighbor and say, I'm a legislator. All right, and then love on them, and we'll see y'all Wednesday night or Tuesday morning. Which one do you want to come to? Bless you, bless you, bless you.